morning. I do uh, appreciate all the work that's been done uh, to get us where we are. You will recognize on the stage, we referred to them last night as naked Christmas trees, okay? We do have some naked Christmas trees up here, but these are going to be decorated this week uh, by some folks, and we're very appreciative of that. Uh, so we do have a lot going on uh, because it is that time of year. We only have uh, just a few weeks before we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, okay? So we will begin today uh, with the three Sundays that remain leading up to uh, Christmas in our uh, talking about and ministering on our Christmas sermon series. Now today we will discuss believe, okay? And over a hundred times in the King James Version, that word is used in the New Testament alone, over 100 times. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to John chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 60 this morning, and I apologize if the trees may get in the way a little bit of the screen, but hey, you've got your Bibles and they never fail, okay? So always bring your Bible to the house of God. I really encourage you to do that and fall in love with God's Word. John chapter 6 and verse 60. Now, um, we know, and I've told you this before, that I believe that John chapter 6 and verse 66 is the saddest verse in the entire Genesis to Revelation book of the Word of God. I believe of all the scripture that we could find that John chapter 6 and verse 66 is the saddest of them all. And it says, therefore, and I'm going to come back and read the text, but John chapter 6 and verse 66 says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Speaking of Christ, they quit. And I believe of all the verses that we can read in the Word of God, how could any verse be more detrimental, be more sad, disheartening and discouraging than to know that there were people that were following Christ, listening to what he had to say, seeing the miracles that he was doing, and chose to quit. And the Bible says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. How sad. I'm not interested in quitting today. I asked someone this last night. I said, in 40 years from now, when I am 82 years old, I said, will you still be here? And we started laughing and talking about how old we would be, and it was even brought up that as grumpy as I am now, they could not imagine what I would be like at 82 years old. And that's probably true, and I don't know if I'll make it to 82 years old, but if I do, that would be 40 more years that I will be here at God's house. I plan on being right here in 40 more years because I have no intentions of quitting. And what about you? Is it that you, if you, God blesses you to live another 10, 15, 20, 25, I mean, what is your long-term plans as far as God's house? Not just God's house, more importantly, your relationship with God. Are you planning on staying the course? Are you in this thing for real? It's life or death. You better be. I mean, you may have all kinds of plans to retire, to buy a vacation home, to move, to transport somewhere else, to maybe um, be as the birds are, go south during the winter and back up here when the warmer weather hits. Maybe that's what your plans are. Or maybe you're going to work for a long time and because you love work, which I don't know anyone that wants to work forever, but we all make long-term plans, we know that. But I'm talking about, are you planning to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ tomorrow as you are today? Next week, the following week, no matter what life comes, how life goes, whether it be good, bad, ups, downs, challenges, Victories, are you still planning to stay with Christ? I am. That is a part of my testimony is I don't want Christ to save me and I just go as if he has done one thing for me and that's all I need him to do. My friend, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ tomorrow and the next day and yes, even 40 years from now. I don't want to quit. The Bible says this in John chapter 6 and verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, because Jesus had just preached a strong message, 
one that was difficult to receive. And the Bible says that when he got done, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that the disciples murmured at it, he saith unto them, Does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the, fret, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words Jesus said that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father. Now, we're going to go a little bit deeper into this here in just a little bit because Jesus is going to ask Peter, and you can go and read this sometime, but Jesus goes on to ask Peter, who was sort of known to be like the spokesperson of the 12 disciples. And when he seen that some of the disciples and some of the people that were following him, they quit. They walked away. Have we had people quit this church? Oh, it's evident that we have. I've said for a long time, and many of you that's been here much longer than I have would agree, and I believe it's not only applicable to our church here at Willow Farm, but to all the churches here locally, that if we had all the people that were one time attached to this church and that quit, if they would come back, why, we wouldn't have a parking lot big enough to hold them this morning. I mean, our church, we would have to go up in three, four, five times the size that we are now if we could somehow go out and get all the people that have quit and bring them back for one service and ask them the question, why did you quit? I mean, this is life or death. And Jesus goes on to ask Peter. He said, are you going to quit too? And Peter said, absolutely not. Peter said, I'm not a quitter, I'm not going to quit. But he gives a reason why that he was not going to quit. Peter answered him and said, Lord, this is in verse 68, if you've got your Bible open, the Bible says that Peter said, Lord, where am I going to go? And who am I going to go to? And I ask you the same question this morning before we even talk about believing in Christ. I'm going to ask you if Christ is not the answer for your life, then who is? If the way of salvation is not your way to heaven, then what is? And are you going to quit? And I hope that you would respond just like Peter and say, under no circumstances, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up the, the words of eternal life. Peter said, if I quit you, Jesus, where would I go? If I quit you, who would I go to? So Peter goes on to say, we believe he was a spokesperson for those that were around him. John and the other of the 12 disciples, they said, he said, we believe and are sure that thou art Christ, the son of the living God. We believe. The Grinch said this, Dr. Seuss wrote these words. Many of your kids, you may not be familiar with the Grinch and who he is or the movie, but your kids are. And they've watched this probably no doubt many times, and you've seen that green creature many times throughout the Christmas holiday. And in that movie, the Grinch, after he thought he had destroyed the Who's in Whoville and their Christmas spirit by taking away all of their gifts, he then begins to hear the rumbling and the joy coming from Whoville. And as he's looking down upon them, he's doing so in utter shock because he thought he had stolen the spirit of Christmas. Dr. Seuss wrote these words for the Grinch to say, end quote, Christmas came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till the puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? The Grinch was right and on the right path that, yes, 
you take away the boxes, the bags, the packages, and the tags, we would still have Christmas. If you take away all the commercialization, if you took away all the stores, if you took away all the wish lists, and yes, for the adult ears that are here this morning, if you took away Santa Claus and the elves on the shelf, if you took away the snowmen and the reindeers, and you took away all the movies and, and all the little fun things that we do, if you took all of those away, yes, there would still be Christmas. Why? Because those are just add-ons that we have done over the years to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when we say Merry Christmas and we begin to talk about Christmas and we begin to get festive and we decorate and we see the lights and the ribbons and the boxes and the bowls and the gift exchange, and yes, it does seem like that during this time of year, even the most hardened of hearts seems to get a little softer because after all, it is Christmas. And so I ask you this morning, what do you believe in? What is your beliefs? Everybody has an opinion today, and it doesn't even have to be on a subject that they know anything about. Everyone is an expert on all things. And we know that because they express their opinions on what we know is social media. It is a platform by which people that are ignorant can go online and show how ignorant they really are. Amen? I mean, that's what it's for. What is Facebook, Jody? Oh, it's a place where dummies go and be dumb. And you didn't know how dumb some of your neighbors were until they began to post things on Facebook. And it would have been better for them if they would have stayed off of it and you wouldn't have thought how dumb they really are. You might have thought they were something different. I guess that's why Abraham Lincoln said it's better to be thought of as a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Amen? All right, so that's just my little tidbit on that. But what do you believe in? Some would say, oh, I don't believe in God. You can't prove God to me. And I agree that there are some people that will never be convinced there is a God because their heart will always be hardened to the ways of the world. I read some articles just this week. Matter of fact, late last night I was reading some articles on people trying to convince me why. That we ought to celebrate Christmas, but we ought to let the religious stuff go. Well, that seems like a, a terrible oxymoron to me. That you're going to celebrate Christmas, but yet you don't need Christ. Oh, and the world has done that for years. We hang on to the religious holidays, but we don't hang on to the Christ that we worship. And we do everything else, but we don't believe. What if you don't believe? Well, the Bible says this. I want to give you two examples, and then I'm going to talk about how that believing and what we believe is a matter of life and death. There was a blind man one time that was healed, and the Pharisees refused to believe it. But the Bible says in John chapter 9 and verse 38, he said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Everyone else may not believe, but I believe. The blind man said, I believe. And the Bible says that he worshiped Christ because he believed that he was the Son of God. Then we find in Luke chapter 8 and verse 12, and you can follow along on your outline, Here's why that it's so important that we believe in it. It highlights to us the importance of our belief. Even so much, it tells us how that the devil is willing to swoop in so quickly and keep us from believing. The Bible says, those by the wayside, remember the sower, the gardener, the farmer, he goes out and he sows seeds and some seed come up and they bloom and they blossom and you get the fruit thereof. But there are many other seeds that never flourish. Why? Because they fall on the stony ground, they fall on the rocks, they fall by the wayside, they fall in areas to where maybe the weeds overtake them. And Jesus is using this as a parable to say how that you and I receive the word of God. Everybody that has the natural ear is hearing what I say this morning and you're going to have to respond to that you may not want to respond but you're going to respond doing nothing is a response in and of itself 
You may choose to ignore what God is saying by me and through the man of God this morning, but that in itself is a reaction that you have. You say, I'm just going to come to church to mark my one Sunday off a month so that you won't call me or check on me, and I'll be back sometime in the new year. Well, that's fine, but that is a response in and of itself. Or you may come this morning and you're eager to receive God's Word and you open up God's Word and you feast from God's Word and you go out this week and you apply it to your life and be the believer that God desires for you to be. You are obedient to the commandments of God and you live the transformed life that God gave you. That is a response. Some may be stuck somewhere in the middle and you're haphazardly receiving the Word of God. Maybe sometimes you'll do it when it's convenient, but when it's not convenient, you'll discard it. That is a response. But there, the Bible says that the, when the farmer went out and he sowed the seed, the word of God, just like we're doing this morning, those by the wayside are those that hear. They hear what the preacher has to say. They hear what the word of God is saying to them. Then cometh the devil. The devil is a real person. We didn't put the devil away in a costume box on October 31st when Halloween was over. The devil is still very much prevalent today. Matter of fact, I would say that the devil is causing more chaos in society today than he ever has because people are following after him and too ignorant and blind to realize it. And the Bible says that the devil taketh away the word of God out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Lest they should believe. So, so we got a battle going on this morning, right? I mean, I like competition as much as the next person. If you like competition, why, I mean, you've had your feel of late. I mean, we've got football overlapping with basketball, and we've got all kinds of playoff games and NFL, and we've got all the, I mean, just the, every night it seems like there's a big game somewhere. Now high school has started. You've got girls basketball, boys basketball, so we've got NFL, college playoffs. I mean, you've got it all right now. You're trying to learn the names of the new Kentucky players for the next six months, and you'll quickly forget them. In hopes that when March rolls around that we're there. But I, I'm saying that right now we see competition everywhere. And for those that love competition, I mean right now, it's got to be one of your most favorite times of the year. And there's a competition that's taking place in God's house this morning. What is that competition? There is a battle taking place to when the word of God goes out that says believe. You ought to believe. Why believe? Because the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now God's telling you that this morning. God is saying believe in me. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is not just some run-of-the-mill Sunday morning where you come to church, Jody bores you to death for 30 minutes, and we get to go home, and we'll eat, and maybe we'll decide to come back tonight, and maybe we won't. But hey, we, that's our Sundays. We'll relax. We'll enjoy the day. We'll prep for the upcoming week. But look at the competition that's taking place in God's house here this morning to where God is sending the word out, and as soon as it hits your heart, Satan is coming in and try to steal it away. That's what the Bible says. That the devil cometh and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe. Because Satan knows if you believe. If you believe, then you can be saved. And if you're saved, then one day you're going to go to heaven and the devil can't own you. The devil can't destroy you. The devil can't have your eternal life. And he knows that. So the best thing he can do is to be reactive to what Christ is doing this morning and that's trying to get you to believe that you might be saved and your life can be changed and the devil says no you don't need that don't listen to that it's foolishness Jody don't know what he's talking about look at all the mistakes he's made look at all these people around you this morning look at where they've been look at what they've done look at the rumors you've heard about them and you can go around to every pew and you can find something wrong with everybody. Amen? Amen? This church is not made up of perfect people. This church is made up of normal people that wants to be better. And the only way we can be better is come to know Christ as our personal Savior. And we believed in Him and He changed us. We're not what we used to be. We're not perfect, but we're not what we used to be. 
I mean, let's just be honest. We're just a bunch of misfits trying to get to heaven. I mean, if you want to, you say, Jody, can I come to Willow Fern? You might as well. <laughs> you might as well. I mean, look at what we've got. We've got a mess here. What are we? We're just a bunch of imperfect people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and based on that belief, God's going to take us to heaven. Do we deserve it? No. Did we earn it? No. But he gave it to us. Why? Because we believe. What do you believe? You believe just what Peter said. That thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. There was one man who got so tore up. He come up to a man, they were talking in a restaurant. And he said, he started talking about what he believed. And the man wanted to get to the bottom of what he did believe. And he said, well, that church you go to, what do they believe? He said, they believe what I believe in. The man questioned further, said, okay, what do you believe in? He said, I believe what the church believes in. The man finally said, well, what do both of you believe? And that man said, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and so, what do you believe? I mean, what are you staking your life on? Matthew, I mean, John chapter 8 and verse 24. Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now that's to the point. Sometimes you just got to tell the truth. And sometimes the fewest words are the most powerful. You don't need a big, long, boring, drawn-out situation. We're going to be here 10 more minutes. That means for 30 minutes, God has spoke to you and offered you, through the Word of God, the opportunity to be saved and be transformed and come out from your sins and to be forgiven and your sins washed away and to live a new life this week. That's what Christ wants to do for you. And all He's asking you to do is believe. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of your works, lest any man should boast. It's not about you. It's about what God wants to do for you. And if you don't believe, you'll never make it. You say, well, Jody, is that your opinion? No, I'm reading it right from God's Word. Where Jesus said, you shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am He, speaking of Christ and being the Son of God, Christ said, if you don't believe that I'm the Son of God, if you don't believe in me, you can't believe in the Father. For if you believed in the Father, you would believe in me. And if you choose not to believe, you shall die in your sins. Not everyone that dies goes to heaven. It's a fact of life. Matter of fact, more people go to hell than they go to heaven. The Bible says the road's broad that leads to hell. It's a narrow one that leads to heaven. Fewer people are going to heaven probably at a rate today than they ever have. Why? Because we are rejecting the invitation that God is giving to us that says, believe on me and you shall be saved. Believe on me, believe on me, believe on me. Over a hundred times, it's from Matthew to Revelation, you cut it right there. From there, from here to the end, over a hundred times, we have the word believe. Is it important? Oh, I believe it is. Believe. You know what Jesus had just said before John chapter 8 and verse 24 when he says if you don't believe you're going to die in your sins. You know what he had said? He said I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. And Jesus said, if you don't believe that and you don't come out from your sins and you stay in darkness, in hell you will live for an eternity. And my friend, don't come to me with this hogwash about hell's only going to be so bad and how it's going to be endurable and how it's only going to end or how it's going to be for a certain amount of time and then it'll end and everybody's going to spontaneously combust and that'll be the end of it. So hell's not that bad after all. Let me tell you something. Hell lasts just as long as heaven. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that hell is for an eternity just like heaven. We sing the song that says about heaven and God's amazing grace. When we've been there for 10,000 years, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise. You want to talk about growing old with me here? What about trying to grow old with me for 10,000 years? And you look around and you've got 10,000 more to go. You may want to ask for a change of address. If God puts you beside of me in heaven, you may want to say, God... Can I get a new residence? But I won't be like I am here. 
I'll be better over there. Why? Because I'm going to have a body like Jesus. Everything is going to be perfect. No tears, no crying, no, no death, no separation, no pandemic, no shooting, no violence, no murders, none of that stuff. It's going to be a perfect place, and I'm going to be perfect over there. Amen? So you can live beside of me in heaven and be just fine with it. The power of believing. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22 said, The scripture hath concluded all are under sin. We know that. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Being a sinner doesn't exempt you from heaven. It does not. Heaven is not for perfect people. Heaven is for saved people. How do I get saved? I'm glad you asked. The Bible says that the jailer one time asked that question, and I'm going to conclude with that here this morning in just a second, but the jailer was in trouble. He knew that his life was on the line, and he come to the man of God, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe. Believe what? Believe that Christ is the Son of the living God, and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says he not only got saved, but everybody in his house, they all got baptized that day. And life for that jailer was drastically different from that day forward. People are living in misery. They want for joy. They want for peace. They, they are longing for something that will bring value to their life. And yet they, they go back to the same pig pen every day to try to find what wasn't there the day before. Can I tell you, if happiness wasn't in the muck of the world, it's not going to be there. If it wasn't there today, it won't be there tomorrow. I mean, if you've tried and you've spent your weeks at the liquor store and you have bought and bought and bought and drank and drank and drank and you have done that till you just can't do it no more and you finally look around and say, maybe the answer is not in that bottle, then why would you go back and do it again? If the answer wasn't there yesterday, it's not going to be there today. Amen? Amen? And don't get me started on those other places that you know I hate. And I believe we've popped up a few more. But if you didn't win there last night, you're not going to win there tonight. Amen? I mean, there's a reason more of those are popping up. Why? Because those people are making the money while you, the fool, are paying them to do so. Amen? If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, you've not been here long enough. And I mean, if you've not been here in a week, you may not know what I'm talking about, but hang on, because I'm not letting go. And so what do you believe in? I'm telling you that God wants to change your life. You say, well, how do you know my life needs to be changed? I can see it on your face. I mean, there's some people that are just absolutely showing to us that they need a change. I, I had somebody come in my office this week, and it was over a small matter, but, and it was a serious one. It was a small in, in, in large part. And she said, Jody, come here for a second. And I went in there, and, and as soon as I went in my office, she just busted into tears, and she said, hey, I've had all I can take. We've all been there. We've all been to that end of the rope moment, just like this jailer was. It was the end of the road. Something had to change. Something had to give. I've been there. You've been there. To when we say, if life is like this, I don't want to live another day. I can't go any further. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. That may be you this morning. Well, why did God bring you to church to tell you that this could be the last day that you have to live that miserable, stinking life? Because you can come to Him and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and you'll go out of here singing like a bird. And you'll sing things like, How great thou art. And you'll sing things like victory in Jesus. And you'll go out of this place rejoicing. And the people that used to know you, they'll say, what is going on with that person? Why are they happy? Why are they changed? They look different. They act different. They talk different. They, everything is different about them. And you'll be able to say, I went to church and God knocked on my heart's door. The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, for God is knocking at our heart's door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will come in to me, will open up. I will come in to him, sup with him, and he with me. 
But there is an action there on your part. Some say there doesn't have to be an action there on your part. I disagree with that. I've read much about that. I don't think that Christ is ever going to barge into your life and make you worship him. No, that's not what the God of heaven is about. Nothing in the word of God proves to us that God has ever forced anybody to worship him. If that were the case, then in John chapter 6 and verse 66, when the Bible says those disciples quit, if it was the case that Christ was going to embark upon your life, embark upon your life, and force you to worship him, then then those disciples would have never left. But there is something that God ultimately gives to you and I, and that is to the ability. I wish I had a door. We're getting ready to make a door up here. It should have been this week. Men, you should have had the door up here. And you know what? We're going to put it about right in here. And I wish I had the door because some somehow, and I don't even know if I've got the words to describe how that God in his, in his sovereignty and God in his all-knowing ability and all power, I don't know how he did it, but somehow when he knocks, He doesn't come in until you and I open the door. And and you and I have that ability to be able to reach to the heart, the door of our heart, and we can either turn the knob and let Christ in, or we can keep it shut. And if you want proof of that, I'll prove to you in people's lives. How that God has knocked at their heart and they've either opened the door or they've either kept it shut. Can you imagine slamming the door in the face of God who's wanting to give you a new life? And yet at times we've all done it. Let me give you some more just real quick. I'm just going to read them to you and then I'm going to ask here this morning who wants to believe. Mark chapter 9 verse 23, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst not If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Romans 10, 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that Christ hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. John 1 and 2, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What does all that mean? I want to say to you this morning the same thing that Paul told or that Peter told that man when he said, what must I do to be saved? And he said, if thou believest. Do you believe? Do you believe? When, it, when, when the eunuch was wanting to be baptized and he asked the man of God whose name was Philip, he said, there's a body of water. Why can't I be baptized? And the man of God says, If thou believest, thou mayest. If you believe, you can. But everything in this church, everything in this spiritual life, everything in salvation, everything about heaven and forgiveness of sins, you can't have any of that until you first believe. Now we tell our kids about the magic of Christmas, right? The magic of Christmas. We tell them, if you don't believe, he will not come. If you don't believe, there may not be any gifts under the tree. If you don't believe, if you don't believe, you've got to believe in the magic of Christmas. I'll leave it at that. Just for those who may still holding on to a little hope. But I will say this. If you want the blessings to be on your life from Almighty God, you've got to believe. If you want to change and you want God to give you a better life, a whole new life, a new heart, a new outlook, new friends, new acquaintances, new church. I mean, if you want something to change, you've got to believe. You say, you say Jody, you don't understand how bad my life is. I don't need to. I'm just telling you, you may have a terrible one, but if you want a great one, believe. You say, well, I've got a good life. Let's just be honest. It ain't near the one you could have if you believed. Amen? So I say to you from Acts chapter 16 and verse 30 and 31, 
My response to you this morning is, if thou believest, thou mayest. You want to be saved? You come up to me this morning, you say, Jody, I want to be saved. What do I need to do? I'm going to tell you, if thou believest, thou mayest. Jody, I want a whole new life. If thou believest, thou mayest. Jody, I want to be baptized. If thou believest, thou mayest. Jody, I want to join your, I want to, I, I know we say your church, but I told somebody last night, it's as much yours as it is mine. Maybe I'll say it like this. Jody, I want to join our church here at Willow Fern. If thou believest, thou mayest. I want to be blessed this week. If thou believest, thou mayest. Everything this season, on whether or not you rightfully celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, hinges on the fact, do you believe? Do you believe? Not about a man with fat cheeks and a fat belly and an old gray beard. That resembles something a lot like what you're looking at this morning. <laughs> That's why I trim my beard to say that this morning. Not so that you can hope that some guy will fall down a chimney and put presents under the tree. No, no. I'm talking about celebrating that little baby who was born in a manger because there was no room for him in the end who came to be the Savior of your life and the Savior of this world. If thou believest, thou mayest. Stand with us this morning all over God's house as we give somebody the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord.